Vamos ver o dedo, ó. Oh, 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 Do you have a prayer book? Prayer book. Could you just see there? I don't have any view. This loudspeaker. There's a loudspeaker there in the way. And then there's I'm 
By take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, and I am enlightened, the practices of listening to the teaching. By listening to the teaching, may the merit that I gain be the cause for me to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings.
His Highness is asking for a Lama Kanjo. Unze Kanjo should be cheated. His Highness is joking, saying that the Lama is also limping these days and the chant master is also limping. Oh, yeah. That's it. And then he's always made an homage, a homage to yeah, that's Buddha. And so today in Tibet, for the last 600 years, uh, this Menlam festival, prayer festival, has been uh, going on since the time of Lama Tsongkhapa, uh, who started this Menlam festival in Lhasa. So we have the, uh, this tradition since then, but since uh, 1959 there has been a huge change uh, inside Tibet, inside Tibet Buddhism and its philosophical study, as, uh, which are studied through logic. So we had a very profound tradition of Buddhism we just learned uh, through logic, and so this is almost in the, st at the stage of dying these days. But then, truth always uh, cannot fade its power. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, the might of weapons may be very powerful for temporarily, but then it cannot survive forever. And so there has not been in the history, this has not been the case, uh, this has been the case with uh, uh, the weapons uh, in the world. And even today, wherever, everywhere in the world, we see, whether in the east, west or north, south, uh, you cannot uh, come to a very permanent, uh, conclusive decision through, uh, the, through the might of uh, weapons. So Tibetan Buddhism, when we use the term chu or dharma, so this is a general term for which can be, of course, uh, the term dharma can be applied to other uh, religious traditions like Christianity, uh, Islam, Jew and so, Judaism and so forth. But then when we talk about Buddhism, the teaching of the Buddha, Uh, we have to understand that it is a teaching which uh, allows us to use this uh, human intelligence uh, uh, to the maximum. And so when we talk about truth also, all of us do not want suffering but want happiness. And these come through causes and conditions. So uh, suffering, pain and happiness and joy do not come without causes and conditions. So, of course, physical uh, pleasure uh, comes in dependence on external materials, but then uh, the mental ones do not come from outside. So, a lot of causes and conditions work together in order to uh, bring about happiness and uh, suffering. So, we have to know the causes and conditions which bring about uh, suffering and then try to uh, overcome them. Of course, in other religious traditions, they uh, of course, all the different tra religious traditions aim at overcoming human suffering and 
having more uh, happiness in our uh, human uh, community. But then Buddhism is mainly focusing on the transformation within in order to gain happiness, in order to have happiness. So the Buddha said, you are the master of yourself. What does this mean? Your uh, happiness and suffering have to, uh, happiness that you want have to be achieved through your effort and the suffering that you don't want have to be overcome through your effort and not merely through prayers. Buddha said the Buddhas do not wash away the sins of sentient beings with water, do, nor do they uh, pick out uh, the, the suffering of sentient beings, like picking out some, some thorn that is stuck in your feet. Or, uh, well, but uh, by showing the truth, uh, the reality of things, they uh, help sentient beings. So the Buddha says that uh, the Buddhas cannot transpose the, his own realization, his own experience, omniscient mind, into others. Mere, just by showing the truth or the reality, which means interdependent nature of things, uh, whether it's uh, we are talking about uh, in terms of causality or uh, in terms of uh, interdependence by way of designation, so this is what the Buddha shows from his own experience. So, having found this truth and reality himself through his own investigation and practice, and th therefore the Buddha taught the truth of the uh, interdependent nature of things in terms of causality. We have the causes uh, and con uh, conditions giving rise to the effects. And then by showing that uh, the interdependent nature of things in terms of desi uh, the mere designation, uh, the Buddha shows the, the final reality of things that there is no self in self-identity, uh, independent self-identity in things. And therefore you have to use, in order to get to this, in order to understand and get insight into this, you have to use your intelligence. Not, it cannot come merely through prayers and uh, belief. So when I give uh, so to some friends uh, whom I meet uh, sometimes, uh, I mean people whom I meet sometimes, uh, I give them, when I give them the statue or picture of a Buddha, I always tell them that Buddha is someone uh, who was a philosopher and a thinker. He's, the Buddha was a thinker, a philosopher, um, and also I tell them that the Buddha, through his own in experiment, investigation of things, um, and the way he has taught us how to go uh, about with investigating uh, the reality of things is, he says, oh, monks and scholars, just as a gold is tested by rubbing, cutting, and scorching, Likewise, you should uh, examine my teaching, and uh, do not, uh, you should not believe uh, me merely out of your devotion to me. So this is what the Buddha says, that you should not just believe what I have said out of your devotion to me, but you should investigate, experiment the teachings, and when you see the reason, uh, then you uh, when, and we, you, you, you try to apply those teachings within yourself and experiment it within yourself and you find them to be really effective and beneficial, then you should accept what I have taught. Otherwise, uh, just because something is said by the Buddha himself, and thinking that it's very sacred and holy, um, I mean, you should not go uh, believe in the, uh, his teachings merely out of this kind of belief. Even some scientists that I know say that, oh, the teaching of the Buddha is sometimes this. Uh, they also say that this Buddha was actually a scientist himself. So, I uh, when I give the uh, uh, 
the picture or the image of a Buddha to others, I also say that the Buddha was a scientist because what he has taught has to be found through uh, experiment, through investigation and not out of blind faith. Just as the Chinese say uh, that we are actually uh, believing in the teaching of the Buddha with blind faith, it's not that. So of course we pray to the Buddha, um, and, but in, in order to make the teaching of the Buddha really effective for yourself, So His Holiness is uh, telling the people to come up to the front, so move up to the front and don't leave the, the front space in front uh, empty. <laughs> so if, if, if you come to the front, um, you will get the sweet, sweetened rice also, otherwise you m may not get it <laughs> if you sit at the back. Many people have the idea that when we talk about Buddhism that uh, all religions, of course, are the same. So Buddhism is the same as other uh, religions. So some time ago I went to uh, Jispa and on the way to Jispa I, ha I was stopped on, at a place in the in a village, and then uh, I met the people there whom I knew from the past also, and I told them, you are all Buddhists, and I asked them what Buddhism is, and they answered, it is about taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and then I asked what the Buddha is, who is the Buddha, and they said uh, they didn't know. And then I asked whether the Buddha and Brahma and Shiva and all these are same. And they, the answer is yes. The answer was yes. So what that shows is their, their ignorance about the teaching of the Buddha itself. Of course, the different traditions have been really beneficial to millions of people throughout the history. And therefore, there's every reason that we should respect the teach other religious traditions. But when it comes to actually being practical about the uh, teachings, in Buddhism, uh, you have to uh, bring about the change in the uh, people's uh, perspective through study of philosophy. So you have to change, make change in how you perceive this self who doesn't want suffering and wants happiness. And then we also have to um, make change, I mean, transformation within the person who looks at things. And so uh, by reducing the causes and conditions which give uh, suffering and by uh, in increasing uh, the uh, causes and conditions which give us happiness uh, based on such understanding, through philosophical investigation. And you'll really make big change. Of course, I don't have much experience, but it compared to some, uh, compared to others who may not have any experience, maybe I have better experience of this. So when you meet with conditions, uh, it depends much on your way of thinking. If you could look at things from a certain perspective, re realizing or un understanding the reality, how that thing has come about, then it will not be disturbing you. So Buddhism is about making some change, changing your way of looking at things. 
In other words, uh, through our biased attitude, when we see something that we like, it's good, then we are too excited about them. And when we see something uh, which we dislike, then we uh, grow aversion to them. So these are due to our biased attitude. So because of our biased uh, way of looking at things, we always cause um, problems. So when you are not biased and you are able to see the reality, and then this will, this will help even when you are in the heat of the moment, when you are about, uh, when you're, uh, about to become angry or something, then you will be able to check within yourself how you are uh, actually looking at the things. And therefore you have to change your way of looking at things in order to make change, in order to make change within yourself. And then, of course, the Buddhism also emphasizes the compassion. Of course, compassion is uh, t uh, something which all the religious traditions teach. Love, compassion, kindness, and all this. Uh, in Buddhism, not only for uh, human beings, but we are talking about be having love and compassion to all sentient beings whether it's Pali tradition or Sanskrit tradition of Buddhism, uh, the, uh, the teaching of the Buddha is uh, founded on the, uh, or rooted in compassion. And especially in Mahayana, the Sanskrit tradition, uh, there is emphasis on holding others more dearer than oneself, cherishing others more than oneself. And so, on the one hand, we have the philosophical understanding uh, through which we can overcome or, or do, do away with biased attitude of looking at things. And on the other hand, we have uh, the uh, understanding of the benefits uh, of uh, holding others more dearer than oneself and the disadvantages of holding oneself more dearer than others. And then you have to uh, hold others to be dearer. So I met some uh, British or English uh, who was working in some, uh, doing some social work or something, and I said, they are, it's very good. <laughs> so he's looking after people who are uh, homeless. Uh, on the one hand, of course, it's very sad when people have no home. They have no way, nobody to turn to, and which is very sad, of course. And uh, I told him that I also uh, am with him or her. But now we are in the 21st century in the world. Uh, these days in the world, where when some Part, when there's some problem in some part of the world, it is also felt in other parts of the world and people are really sympathetic. People in other parts of the world are uh, sympathetic to them. And so when there is some disaster in some part of the world, people move uh, and uh, people have moved and try to help them. So I told him that, uh, I told this person that we have a very big family now. We are one family, a human family. So of course we uh, may be uh, homeless uh, personally, but then you should, uh, people should not think that they, should, uh, they are homeless and alone and all that, because we are, we are all in one family. So if this is the case with the Tibetans, I usually also joke, I usually joke that uh, when I was four, I actually uh, separated uh, from my uh, family, my uh, birthplace. So I had to leave my home in Kumbum, in Amdo, at, uh, when I was four. And from then until the, uh, I was 24, I lived in uh, Lhasa. And then, then I also uh, lost this, uh, my home 
at, uh, when I was 24 or 25, I lost my home, my country. And so we are also refugees, which means that we, have, we are homeless. But then we also have lots of friends in this uh, human family, in this uh, world, which is my, our home. And we have lots of friends in it, and so we also um, are live uh, happily. And therefore, thinking that you are homeless, people should not uh, feel depressed and all sad. So you have to uh, muster up courage and uh, so, of course, uh, other religious traditions uh, talk about love and compassion. Uh, but in particularly in Buddhism, because all sentient beings, including yourself, do not want suffering but want happiness, so just as yourself, you don't want suffering and you want happiness, therefore others are same, and therefore we are all same in that sense. And therefore, uh, as we are all same in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, it is uh, uh, not right to only think about one's own happiness and uh, uh, disregard others' happiness. So we live in human uh, society, and therefore all our uh, the necessities of life, such as food, clothing, shelter, and, and even uh, fame, and so. So all these, all kinds of excellences that are in life do not come from the sky, fall from the sky, nor do they grow from the uh, earth, but you have to put effort in them. And therefore, if you, take, if you think of helping others more, then because the others are, uh, you are dependent on others for all the necessities of life, therefore you'll be the winner, you'll have um, the profit. And so when you disregard others, neglect others and forget others, then you are actually neglecting or disregarding the source of your happiness. If you make others unhappy, if you uh, make others your enemy, how can you actually be happy? Of course, you may be able to bully someone or, uh, for the time being, but then you will not remain, uh, live, and you will not be able to live, in ha live happily. So if you do not, uh, of course, when you make others unhappy and so forth, you, they lose trust in you, and therefore you can't have friends, which, is, um, which means that the trust is uh, the, the, uh, the source of one's happy, uh, friendship. So even if you may, be, uh, you may have um, uh, some uh, physical might or power, but then if you are not honest, then people will not also like. So you have to be honest as well to others. In the 60s, in, uh, in the Kulu region of Himachal Pradesh, many Tibetans worked as road builders. And one family had a child. And there was a court case, a legal case, between a family who was blamed, who were accused of uh, stealing uh, from another family who uh, lost something. And so uh, at that, in those days, there was an old man in the village nearby uh, this man was uh, believed to be really uh, trustworthy. Who doesn't? Uh, everybody believed that he doesn't. Uh, he didn't tell lie at all. He was always very honest, and therefore, in uh, so this legal matter was actually not uh, taken to the court, but actually taken to this uh, honest old man. 
in order to make the decision for them. So this old man, of course, was not trusted by people because of his power or might or uh, in authority or anything like that, but then um, because of his honesty, and therefore honesty won him more friends and people uh, trusting him. And therefore, we need in human society, in order to have good friends, we need honest people. So otherwise, if you lose honesty, then uh, you'll be alone, even if you may be really rich, be millionaires or billionaires, but then you'll just be, because of loneliness, not being able to uh, win others' trust and so forth, you'll remain alone and then you'll take to drinking, alcohol and so forth, um, drugs. So when I meet people sometimes in rich countries, uh, they are, in the beginning when I meet them, of course, they are very, um, they smile and all this, and they talk nicely. But then after a while, when we finish talking about these things, then they started complaining about life. So what we need to cultivate is compassion and love. Well, we all don't want suffering. We want happiness. We have to look at the causes which bring about that. Of course, it depends on your way of looking at things, your perspective. As a person, how you look at the things. Buddhism says that this strong clinging to oneself, the ego clinging, is the source of our suffering. And then you talk about my happiness, and uh, also the people um, outside and things outside, you look at them all as having some kind of independent uh, uh, existence. So Buddhism says that there's no such way of existing, uh, existence of things, that they do not have any independent existence, whether it's yourself, the person who experiences or goes through all these experiences of suffering and pain, or the things outside. Nothing is independently existent. Therefore, this is unique to Buddhism, that there is nothing independent. So, of course, of the many different, uh, perhaps uh, there may be 10 uh, major religions in the world, like Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, Jainism. In, in some of these uh, traditions, uh, like uh, within Hinduism, like Sankhya and uh, so forth, they have the practice of celibacy and also they have the practice of cultivating concentration and so forth. But then, all these practices are done within the belief that there is an Atma, a soul, a, a permanently existing uh, soul or Atma. And this is uh, in fact reinforced through their uh, religious belief as well. And therefore the difference between Buddhism and non-Buddhist traditions is uh, that Buddhism rejects such an uh, I or an ego or an Atma, whereas other religions do believe in them. So Buddhism kind of destroys this uh, this uh, way of looking at an Atma as being uh, as being there, some some kind of independent existence, whereas other traditions believe in it. And so. With regard to Tibetan Buddhism, um, t the Tibetan king, Tisung Detsen, invited Master Shandarakshita to Tibet in the 8th uh, century. And so Tibetan Buddhism was firmly established at that time and it continued until today. And therefore, we follow the Nalanda uh, tradition of Buddhism 
uh, Nalanda tradition, which uh, is actually uh, established through reasoning and logic and experiment. So we have a very uh, rich uh, religious uh, heritage, but then we have very few people who actually are able to apply these teachings within themselves. And uh, we lack people who can actually introduce the, this uh, profound teaching, the tradition that we have, the Nalanda tradition, to others. But generally speaking, because, I mean, thanks to the, the tradition, the religious tradition, Buddhism that we have, uh, even while we were going through, we are going through uh, these difficult times, I and mean, we are still able to maintain some uh, calmness within ourselves. And so, on this occasion of the Manlam um, prayer, uh, it's, we are not merely gathered here for some ceremonial function, um, but we have come here to learn how to make change within ourselves through the practice of compassion and understanding of emptiness uh, by developing the insight into emptiness and also the experience of compassion and bodhicitta and so forth. So today in the world, there is so much bloodshed it's almost like playing with people's lives. And like in Syria, for example, the, the situation there is really sad. And so the rulers the, are killing people, even children, disregarding the preciousness of their life. So, of course, uh, in the world there is so much material development, progress, but then we lack, the, the, there's lack of compassion and love. And because of this, and this may be, because, uh, is, this is because of uh, the uh, educational system as well. And so, the ethics part of the practice uh, of life is uh, not uh, so much um, taken care of, which is more or less uh, left to the religious people. But uh, then, uh, on the one hand, we have religious people who live very uh, narrow-mindedly. And of course, we have in Tibetan society also people who really studied the, the Dharma so much, but then, in the end, they remained an uh, ordinary person. Uh, not making much change. In the text, uh, when we study philosophy, we talk about I mean, not being uh, someone who just uh, plays like a, a devil's at work it and uh, you know just uh, try to. Uh, and learn the teachings merely for the sake of learning them and merely for the sake of teaching others or just uh, blurbing out words and so forth. But then um, uh, we need, of course, to study the teaching. So around the 1959, 57, 58, Mao Zedong's uh, own words were not so much um, trusted or believed by people. In the beginning, when he started his movement, of course, people believed him and his uh, writings were uh, actually used uh, by people. So, Master Thomas Zangbo says that if you don't check within yourself, even if you may be in the guise of a religious person, uh, you will you may, you will still um, you would still engage in non-religious activities, and therefore it is important for us to be careful, to be cautious about what we are doing. And so the situation today in the world is really sad. There is lack of uh, truthfulness, honesty, um, 
people only use power. So with regard to the Tibetan cause, of course, we have the truth on our side. But then we are uh, rather pressed down by force. So we are in a very sad situation. Of course, we should make our prayers which may not materialize immediately, but then it can help. We have to uh, pray to the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. For, the, uh, for peace and happiness in the world, and particularly for people of Tibet. So please make your prayers that we may be out of suffering. So we are now, His Holiness is going to go through the Jataka tale. We are on chapter 28. His Holiness says he may not be able to finish this. So to read this, uh, story. The immense forbearance of the, this this story is about the teacher of restraint or uh, forbearance, patience. The immense forbearance for those who practice patience makes nothing too great to hear, bear. In a previous lifetime, the Bodhisattva once became a certain ascetic. He had seen that the life of a householder, householder was full of suffering and he knew that such a life was not conducive to spiritual pursuits. Beset with temptations, the householder's life was exposed to the inroads and of material and sensual pleasures which entailed the loss of modesty and spiritual goals. Such a life, in emphasizing the passions, was sure to lead to desire, hatred, impatience, anger, arrogance, pride, and greed. So this is saying that in, the, in general, in the world, in the universe, or the ordinary people, of course, everybody don't want suffering, they want happiness, but then the suffering comes from our greed and attachment, which in turn are rooted in our ignorance, which is um, not only the, uh, the ignorance about the causality of things, uh, but also uh, the ignorance about the true nature of things, the reality of things. And so these two uh, types of ignorance, of course, be, give us um, painful experiences. And therefore, it says uh, living a householder's life is full of um, problems. When we live in a human society, of course, we live um, through attachment and with attachment to aversion or greed. And therefore, we are not able to live happily. So we have to know how we use our body, speech, and mind to create negative karmas and try to restrain ourselves and also try to cultivate the virtuous practices, virtuous experiences through our body, speech, and mind which bring about happiness. So if you are able to do that, then uh, you will be happy in family and as well as in your community at large. So this story is about uh, the Buddha when he was born uh, as an ascetic, as uh, someone who has left his home uh, householder's life. So this uh, story is about the practice of forbearance or patience. The term Jatakamala or series of birth stories uh, this, the word itself shows that uh, the Buddha uh, actually uh, was born uh, in many lifetimes was born it's not about just enumerating how many uh, different lives he had in the past uh, 
So in the uh, texts of Nalanda Masters, there are many different reasonings that are used. Uh, generally, it is said that uh, within the things that we should know, there are three types of things. So the things which are obvious to us, which are uh, can be perceived through, through, uh, through our perception, and then there are slightly hidden phenomena which are uh, to be inferred through uh, logic and reasoning. And then uh, there are uh, uh, extremely hidden phenomena. So science is more related to, to, to uh, what is obvious uh, to our perception. Of course, they use uh, different uh, machines and so forth and to uh, see the subtler uh, particles and so forth. But then, basically, they are uh, related to or they're dealing with uh, things which are obvious. And then we have the slightly f hidden phenomena, which have to be understood through a logical reasoning. But then there are certain other things which we see, of course, things happening around us, for example, but then how do we explain them? Of course, they cannot be explained through science. And then in other traditions, they may say, oh, these things happen because of God. Or some may say they are causeless. They come about without causes and conditions. And that's not uh, true. So things have to come through causes and conditions. And those causes and conditions have to be conducive or um, uh, which can actually bring about those uh, results. And therefore, there are many different causes and conditions that bring about things that are outside, happening outside. And similarly, experiences within ourselves, within our mind, there are many different states of mind. And then with regards to the explanation and description of mind, uh, perhaps Buddhism has the most extensive explanation. And so, even scientists today, the uh, neurologists and biolo uh, brain scientists, uh, when they want to really go into detailed and deep uh, explanation, then they find uh, that through the training of minds, we can make change in the brain as well. And therefore, what makes changes in the brain cells uh, is something different. There is something different from the brain. And so if you check the causes and conditions of things, we uh, may have to sometimes just um, predict or just uh, guess why such and such thing happens. And so these may be uh, called uh, slightly hidden phenomena, which uh, we can come to a conclusion that this is that, this is that, this is this, this is that, uh, through logic and inference. So this is considered very important in Buddhism. Uh, the Charvaka tradition, the past, only believed in uh, things that are obvious to us. And within the uh, inferential cognition, uh, which are based on logic, there are uh, those based on factual based uh, logic and uh, also uh, based on the by resorting to some uh, scriptural authority as well. So when we say when we when we relate our uh, happy I mean, dreams to others, of course, people would uh, those who have the experience of happy dreams would understand what that, that means. But then, uh, someone who has no experience of uh, happy dreams, if you tell about uh, if you tell them that you had a happy dream, I mean, you, uh, a good dream that made you happy and so forth, I mean, that other person will not be may may not have any idea about it. And so. Uh, there are some things which have to be, uh, which can be explained and told through experience. And therefore, 
in Buddhism when we talk about the things which are obvious and then things which are slightly hidden. Uh, having gone through that, then we also have the understanding of uh, the causes. So within the causes, there are those which are called substantial causes, which means that the that cause itself actually uh, transforms into the result, whereas the there are the conditions which actually help uh, grow the seed. So the, the agent which brings about some change in the brain has to have some its cause. And therefore, this uh, consciousness or mind has to have a cause which is similar to it. And uh, and so uh, the, the substantial cause of a mind or consciousness has to be something which is a mere experience. And without there being the experience, uh, I mean, dimension to it, the, it cannot be brought about um, by something uh, which is not a mind or consciousness. And therefore, on the basis of this understanding of consciousness, which has its own substantial cause, which is another uh, uh, consciousness, uh, a previous moment of consciousness, we, based on this understanding, we also uh, talk about uh, past and future lives. So in this life alone, for example, we give lots of training to people in order to be successful in their life. So by giving education, by giving training and, and, and skills and so forth, we are looking for some effect, some result. And because the result is, uh, because we are aware that the result is dependent on the causes and conditions which bring about them, therefore we give, uh, we have a goal, and accordingly, in order to reach that goal or achieve that goal, we give education and uh, training to people, and therefore the experiences which we uh, will have in the future have to be brought about through causes and conditions, and therefore we talk about uh, engaging in certain actions, karma. And uh, when we talk about pain and pleasure, I mean, these are uh, experiences within ourselves, experiences within ourselves, and therefore uh, the pain and pleasure have to be related to the mind, mind stream. And therefore, the term Jataka, Jataka Mala, um, or the garland of birth stories, shows this kind of uh, working of uh, cause and conditions that are uh, based on the understanding of the mind that there are past and future lives. Yesterday, uh, the uh, ba people from the Ba region of Tibet uh, offered a long life um, puja offering for me, and they also uh, requested if I could give some teaching. And therefore, uh, I found that today is there a good, uh, good is a good uh, day to do the Avalokiteshvara initiation. So we don't have much time, of course. <laughs> so to... <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism is a, a, a Buddhism which comprises uh, the entire teaching of the Buddha, including uh, the, uh, the basic vehicle, the uh, universal, or the Bodhisattva Yana and Tantrayana. <laughs> and so in order to cultivate the insight into emptiness, uh, first we have to, of course, uh, put effort in uh, bringing about the insight and then pros uh, advance it further and further. 
And so in order to gain insight into evidence, we have to develop, uh, we also have to develop single pointed concentration. And for that, we have to train our mindfulness in mindfulness and introspection. And so the first step to that is uh, restraining uh, negative uh, misdeeds, misbehavior. And therefore, we have the vows of laypersons and the vows of monastics. So Buddha didn't say that all the followers of the Buddha uh, must be monks or nuns, because he gave laypersons vows as well. And then within that, within the laypersons' vows, of course, according to the, uh, the uh, capacity of the practitioners themselves, you, you can take either one or two or three or four, all five laypersons' vows. And so this shows the Buddha's skillfulness uh, in leading the sentient beings, his followers. So we'll not... Most of you may have come to uh, Bodh Gaya, so where I gave the Upasaka vows, the uh, layperson's vows, so I'll not do it here because we have no time. So uh, with the, uh, these vows, of Pratimoksha vows as the basis, and then even in dream, if you could, for example, the monks uh, uh, a fully ordained monk, a bhikshu, should be able to uh, even uh, remember that there are uh, bhikshus or gelongs. And when, when they dream, even uh, when they have dreams where things are getting really hectic and uh, I mean, exciting for them, they should be able to show mindfulness that they are uh, gelongs. And then as Tibetans, you could think that you are uh, born in the land of uh, Tibet, uh, which is uh, the, um, the special um, land of uh, Avalokiteshvara. And therefore, uh, as, the, as someone who is uh, taken care of by the Avalokiteshvara and who is also the follower of the Buddha, I should be really uh, cautious, show caution uh, when I am about to engage, indulge in some uh, misdeed. So you should also check within uh, yourself whether you are actually doing uh, the, the right thing or you are indulging in the wrong things. And with, by using introspection, you should check yourself like that. And when you are about to, when, when you have actually indulged in some wrongdoing, uh, you should uh, through, uh, be able to remind yourself of the, that wrongdoing and uh, repent. So otherwise just doing prayers, a lot of prayers, may not make much um, change within yourself, even if you may, be, uh, you may claim that you are doing some very profound and extensive prayer and so forth. They may not have any effect. They may not mean much to you. One uh, lama has said that uh, in, in uh, when, when you do some retreat or on deity and so forth, if you uh, if you are not able to actually uh, uh, lessen your negative thoughts and emotions while uh, by doing such retreats, it would just be uh, wearing out your fi uh, nails. He said by reciting. Uh, by sending the mala beads and reciting much mantra, many mantras. So there are people who say they have done, they have really recited the Om Mani Padme Hum, the six syllable mantra of Avalokiteshvara, so many times. But having done that, 
um, then uh, um, they even say that uh, by, by reciting the Mani Mantra so many times, their malas have even worn out or their prayer wheels have worn out and so forth. But then uh, there's no certainty that their uh, negative thoughts and emotions may have um, been reduced. They could even uh, be more uh, arrogant having done all these prayers. And therefore, we have to show uh, mindfulness and introspection and uh, keep morality on the basis of that, develop uh, single-pointed concentration, and then we uh, develop insight into emptiness. In uh, Mahayana Buddhism especially, you do not think about your own happiness alone, but then you, uh, when it comes to Mahayana, uh, practice of Mahayana, um, you keep morality not only for your own sake. You don't think that, oh, if I do this, I will have this kind of negative effect. Not only thinking like that, but then you also uh, are concerned for the well-being of others. And keep morality within that understanding. And then develop concentration and then uh, the insight into emptiness. And therefore, with the help of bodhicitta and the uh, insight into emptiness, you'll be able to overcome all the negative thoughts and emotions plus the, uh, uh, the imprints left by them. And then when you add tantra to it, the tantra you know, says that the Buddhahood does not come through causes and conditions which are not uh, uh, similar to them. And then when we, we also talk about the three secrets of body, speech and mind of the Buddha. So what that secrets, the secrecy here refers to the, the difficulty of these being perceived by our mind. We cannot imagine them. And then these three secrets of body, speech, and mind are said to be of one taste. In and they are inexhaustible. In order to be inexhaustible, uh, they have to be of one taste, without which it's not possible. And these three, the body, speech, and mind, are also called Genki Kolo, which means uh, ornamental wheel, something like that, which is to uh, mean, which means that they are uh, there to benefit others. And so, when your body, speech, and mind are of one taste and inexhaustible like that, then you'll be able to, your, wherever your body is, your mind and uh, speech will be there. So in order for the Buddha's activities, enlightened activities as they're called, to be uh, effortless, uh, you have to have these three body, speech and mind to be inexhaustibly um, of one taste. So you have to, this cannot come uh, based on some grosser state of mind, but it has to come on the basis of a very subtle mind and subtle wind. So the subtle wind and subtle mind become uh, manifest within yourself when the grosser ones are subsided. So sometimes it happens that somebody may be really sick for a long time, physically very weak, becoming really weak, but then when they when they die, some, there are many people who uh, stay in what is called thugdam, in meditation, after the clinical death. So when this subtle mind wind is there, uh, uh, although the uh, gross mind and body have um, ceased, um, the subtle mind, when the, the, subtle, uh, the gross mind has ceased, uh, but then when the subtle mind is there, Many of their, their body uh, look very fresh and alive. And so even doctors have witnessed such things in hospitals. And so so this subtle clear light mind uh, is together with the 
uh, innate speech, which is uh, also referred sometimes as the R syllable, uh, the supreme R syllable. So, of course, there's no um, speech uh, uh, really there. But we still, there is this subtle mind, which is uh, not different in nature from the speech, the subtle speech. And so, in Tantra, we have to, in order to reach the Buddha's uh, body, speech, and mind, and attain that, we have to have the uh, course. Uh, even while we are sentient beings. So these, uh, the, the, the body, speech and mind, the secrets, the three secrets being of one taste, cannot just come about uh, without causing conditions. And therefore, we have to understand the procedure by which we lead ourselves to that goal. And uh, when you have some kind of understanding and insight, you'll be able to see, oh, maybe that is possible, that goal is possible. And therefore, Tantra shows, the, uh, teaches the path which has a similar aspect uh, of the, uh, the body, speech, and mind of a Buddha. And so in all the four classes of Tantra, there is the Deity Yoga practice. And so in order to do Deity Yoga practice, uh, of course we have uh, the recitation of mantras, but mainly we have the profound and clarity, I mean uh, yoga, yoga of profundity and clarity, uh, indivis which are indivisible. And therefore, in order to uh, actualize that, we have the uh, in empowerments of Tantra. Uh, within the empowerments, there are those of the liberative uh, 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 empowerment and the ripening empowerments. So of two, of these two, uh, today we are going to do the Chandrasik uh, initiation, the ripening initiation. Uh, Chandrasik is the embodiment of all the compassion of all the Buddhas. So, of course, deities may be, uh, like, uh, as we say, the com uh, embodiment of compassion or uh, wisdom of all the Buddhas. Uh, so, for example, we can have an embodiment of, or a manifestation of a Buddha, um, but then there are also an individuals who uh, can actually become the embodiment of compassion. So when we reach Buddhahood, we also attain what is known as the uh, Dharmakaya, the truth body, which is for one's own uh, benefit. But then we should not think that the Buddhas are some way up there in some Buddha field. But then where the mind of the Buddha is, there is the, uh, the, uh, the physical dimension as well. So in order to serve uh, and help uh, sentient beings, they appear in uh, different uh, forms of deities as well. And so, uh, Chandris, uh, the Avalokiteshvara is the embodiment of uh, the uh, compassion, Manjushri is the embodiment of wisdom, and then Vajrapani is the embodiment of the uh, power of all Uh, then there are sometimes uh, explanations where it's said that the, that the Islamist body is the Avalokiteshvara, uh, speech is Manjushri, and heart is uh, uh, Vajapani, and so forth. And so today we are going to do the, an initiation or empowerment of, and ripening empowerment of uh, Jendrasik, 
Yeah, I've looked at the Shuara with 1,000 arm journalistic, 11 heads. And so this particular initiation is, uh, comes in the lineage of, of uh, Gelongma Palmo. So the other day I watched, uh, I inspected some uh, debate of the monks and nuns, and I saw some nuns debate. They did really well. I congratulate you. So of course in Tibetan Buddhist tradition, we don't have the Gelongma, the Bhikshuni ordination yet. So when you follow a certain Vinaya tradition, you have to follow, uh, st uh, follow them. For example, in the Tibetan tradition, we have the, um, the Mula Sarvasivada tradition, and uh, in China, they have the Dharma Gudba tradition, and then, uh, of course, there are this. So there are some people who criticize me uh, that I'm not really uh, doing uh, uh, anything to uh, to introduce the, the bhikshuni, bhikshuni ordination in Tibetan society. Uh, maybe I am a very staunch uh, supporter of uh, women's rights. Uh, there was a, once a, a conference in uh, Canada, and I said to them, I said at, at the meeting that these days in the world the, there's lack of compassion, love and compassion. So, in order to uh, in order to promote love and compassion, uh, women have more responsibility and more women uh, can, uh, must take more active role in the world to promote love and compassion. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, people in the world lived rather uh, in equality. Equally, uh, there was no such idea as someone being higher and others lower and so forth. But then, as time went by, we had the, the, the agricultural work, work started, and then uh, there was the feudalism and so forth. And then there were um, the corals and um, uh, amongst people, and so people uh, started looking for someone who can actually lead them. And then, because of the physical uh, strength, uh, some men were uh, kind of appointed as the leader of people, because people are not so much concerned about um, education in those days. And then, later on, of course, education took the uh, upper hand. And for example, if you look at Deng Xiaoping, the late Chinese um, leader, uh, he was really a short man, but he was full of knowledge. And because of his knowledge, uh, and then he became leader of China at one time. So uh, we can uh, have equality of men and women between men and women based on the uh, education. So if you look in the world, many of the people who are engaged in murder and killing, slaughter of animals, I mean, the most of them are really men. So people who are involved in bloodshed are mostly men. So even scientists say in their experiments that when they show some uh, picture of, of, of uh, someone who is really going through suffering, much suffering, uh, to a man and a woman, the women uh, uh, show more uh, sensitivity to them. Uh, such as uh, their uh, heartbeat um, and, uh, being faster and blood uh, uh, moving faster and so forth. And so, uh, women have a special role in when we have this need to promote uh, love and compassion. Uh, women, uh, we, we need 
uh, more women to come out and, and take active role. And Mary Robinson was there also, and she 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 gave me a new title, calling me a feminist Dalai Lama. So, I really talk about feminism, uh, I really support, but then with regard to Bhikshuni ordination, it's not in my hands. So it has to be done um, in accordance with the Vinayat. So what I have been emphasizing is that uh, the study of the philosophical texts. Of course, in, the, in Tibet in the past, there had been cases where uh, nuns have been really, uh, if, uh, did really well in the study of philosophy. And so after coming into exile, I have impro uh, encouraged the nuns to study. Uh, of course, when I was in down in South India, uh, I had seen uh, I had seen women debating, nuns debating, and this uh, time here in Dharamsala during this Murnam uh, uh, occasion, it was the first time that we had uh, nuns debating during Murnam. And then I have been also saying that we have to make some plan uh, to have Geshe Mas. So far, it has not been um, put into practice. So we have to see what's best, uh, how best to actually uh, start this Geshema. So there are many uh, nunneries. Uh, we have a Sara uh, College. So we should have people gathered in one of these institutions and uh, to, to put in place uh, a system whereby the nuns could become a Gishima, could get the degree of Gishima. Uh, so this initiation now of gender is uh, has come down from Bhikshuni Lakshmi. So His Holiness is uh, performing the ritual, uh, the ritual cake ceremony or doing the ritual for driving away what are known as obst obstructor beings who might otherwise hinder this practice of the initiation, uh, asking them to come for forward and take this offering of the torma, the ritual cake, and not to uh, and uh, ask to leave this place with this offering and not to disturb the initiation. So this is called uh, offering gektor. So with this um Sumbani mantra,
So the Guru, His Holiness, is ask, uh, calling on the truth, the power of truth of the three jewels and the power of truth of uh, Chandra Sikh, uh, and asking them to ask the obstacle beings or interrupters to leave this place and not to harm this initiation ceremony. And then, after having sent away the obstacle beings, uh, uh, Vajra fence is created uh, around this place where the initiation is going to uh, happen. And then, uh, with regard to the mandala offering, we have already done it earlier. So, next is bearing the correct motivation. So there is a verse in the text uh, which comes from the general sacred tantra. So this verse says that there may be some of you who have come here for the initiation in order to be successful in your life, in order to be, uh, to to be over, able to overcome your sickness and so forth. And uh, for these reasons, you may think of taking the initiation, which is, this is wrong motivation. So you should not have this kind of motivation. And then there may be others who may think that by receiving this initiation from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, it may be it help. It may help me to have higher, uh, uh, to have a human rebirth in the next life as well. And that also is wrong motivation. And similarly, uh, if you think of reach, uh, reaching mere Nirvana uh, uh, by receiving this initiation, uh, that also is a wrong motivation. So. Uh, you should not have all these kind of motivations, but then you sh the, the correct motivation that you should bear is to, to be able to help all sentient beings who are limitless or infinite like this space. And that you may be able to help all these sentient beings. And not only leaving it at that wish, but also to actually engage in the practices which can also help them. So in order to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, you cannot, of course, be, uh, be able to help others in accordance with their needs and their predispositions and uh, interests and so forth. And therefore, Although you may want to help others, but in order to be practical about that, you have to become someone who is completely free from all kinds of faults and uh, be fully knowledgeable about everything. For example, if you uh, if you want if you are, want to become a doctor and want to heal somebody's and uh, sickness, you have to become a very efficient doctor, very knowledgeable and um, experienced doctor, in order to know, in order to be able to diagnose the disease thoroughly. And so you have to be think here to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. In other words, have this motivation of bodhicitta within yourself. So if you think in that way, then you, the, the rest of the uh, uh, goals will be fulfilled. So if you think of becoming a Buddha, a fully enlightened person for the benefit of all sentient beings, what will happen is you'll be able to fulfill your own goal. As Maitreya says, uh, Bodhicitta leads you away from the lower realms of existence. It will lead you to higher existence, a higher rebirth, and it will lead you to the deathless state of uh, omniscience. So, 
So even uh, with regards to uh, refraining from killing, for example, if you do it merely because uh, you think that it will be bad for you, uh, like that you will go to a jail or something, then uh, it is a, a rather inferior type of motivation. Whereas if you do it in all, with, within the understanding that if you do so, the others will be harmed, then, I mean, of course, you are thinking in a more uh, right way. And so, uh, not only thinking of the, what disadvantage you would have, but actually what disadvantage others would have, you have to refrain from uh, negative actions. So, some results which come through much effort for uh, others, uh, which uh, if you can make it come, uh, come about through uh, the practice of bodhicitta, then I mean, of course it's worth doing that. And so bodhicitta is this motivation which thinks of helping others. But then while doing so, while thinking in that way, while motivating yourself uh, in that way, what you actually gain is as a byproduct your own happiness. And so even in this life, if you live a an honest and sincere, dedicated life for the benefit of others, and you put effort in helping others, you'll be happy. This life will be a happy one. And then it's quite guaranteed, uh, it will be, uh, be quite sure that you will have higher rebirth. With only selfish motivation, if, even if you may say some um, the um, six-syllable mantra hundreds of thousands of times, it's not quite certain whether you will have uh, higher rebirth or not. So if you dedicate yourself for the well-being of others with bodhicitta, then it's, I can guarantee you that you will have higher rebirth. You don't have to ask others um, to make prayers for you to have higher rebirth or anything like that. So Kadamba masters also say that, and Indian masters also say that, they, um, you know, if you have a bodhicitta within yourself, genuine sense of caring of others' well-being, um, um, this will help you to uh, accumulate much merit as well as purify negativities. Of course, we pray to Lama Lok San Tuan Doji Chang and all this. Um, so, of course, Lama Lok San Tuan Doji Chang, as we call uh, sometimes uh, doing Lama Chaba prayers and so forth, of course, has come through the practice of bodhicitta and the insight into emptiness. So if you could combine these two, of course, you will reach that goal of uh, Buddhahood. Um, so this body, this human life that you have found once is about to be lost and therefore uh, put every effort in order to lead yourself out of samsara and reach that of uh, Buddhahood for the sake of others. And so we have met with the teaching of the Buddha, especially the teaching where you come across the practice of bodhisattvas, where you hold others to be more dearer than yourself, cherish others more than oneself. And Bodhicitta, uh, Bodhisattva Charya Avatara by Shantideva was said to have been written in the 8th century. So Shantideva, uh, guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, is very profound teaching on the cultivation of Bodhicitta, for the cultivation of Bodhicitta. There is no other teaching uh, greater than this one. So there has not been one in India, and there is no uh, there is none in Tibet. So you have to study it well and practice it. But for me, it has been really, really helpful. Uh, the, 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 the kind of experience, uh, the sort of experience that I have of Bodhicitta and, uh, come, came from this. <laughs> so, 
So I've been telling people to study the sixth chapter and the eighth chapter of uh, Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. And I've been t uh, telling people sometimes that the ninth chapter, maybe there's no hurry. Of course, it's a uh, really complicated one. Uh, and so here, uh, the motivation that you should have in order to take the initiation is the bodhicitta motivation, which is to say that you have to think of becoming, wish to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings and not the other inferior types of motivation uh, should be there. So with this mantra and the sprinkling of the blessed water, uh, from the vase. Now, all the disciples, please. Uh, of course, all sentient beings, including the insects, and um, and everybody has the sense of I, don't we? Whether we know a language or not, we use a language or not, doesn't matter. We have this sense of I. And then we say, my mind, my uh, friends, my family, my house, my teacher. So you refer to all these things uh, with reference to yourself. So where is this I? What is it? Is it in your head, in your eyes, or where? Where is this I? Is it in your heart? In, in that case, then these days there is heart transplant. So then you would have to change yourself. And sometimes the, in that case, some others will say, may say that it's in the brain. But then is it in the front part of the brain or back or where? I know uh, a German uh, brain scientist a really huge man with a big nose. So he told me that, of course, the other religious traditions which um, uh, believe in soul theory. And he said that if there were such a soul, it should be somewhere in the brain. But from his experiment, he said he never found any soul there. But brain works and all these different um, called neurons work together and there's no part of the brain which can be pointed to as being the soul. So he said to me, in Buddhism you talk about no self, not there being uh, no self. And uh, this is really uh, something which is uh, called close to science. So, of course, we think of I in the sense that I am the one who possesses this mind. I am the one who possesses this or that. But then, if you really carefully check where this I is, it's not in the body, of course. If you take the body apart, uh, you will not find it within the body. In that case, could it be in the mind? And in, within Buddhist, uh, Buddhism, there are certain philosophical schools which uh, uh, say that uh, the I or the person is within the mind. They give instances of the mind, which is the identity of the person. And they have uh, still not understood the final thought of the Buddha with regard to what emptiness means. So we have, of course, the sense that this uh, body is governed by something. And it must be, uh, if it's not the body, of course, then, then it must be within the mind. And therefore, they point to some mind as being that. But the finally, uh, what you uh, come to understand is that within the body nor the mind you can posit something as being the I or the person. Nagarjuna says the I, the self, is not the, uh, the aggregates, the psychophysical aggregates, nor something different. 
And he's, say, he's actually in that chapter, or chapter 22 of the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, the, uh, Nagarjuna was actually doing this investigation uh, on the Tathagata. So he says Tathagata cannot be found within his body, nor the mind, nor something different from it. And so I also think about this verse. I uh, recited referring to myself that uh, uh, I, Tenzin Gyatso, am not the four, not, not the, these aggregates, nor something different from it. And the forms, the Tenzin Gyatso is not within the body, nor the, 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 the uh, aggregates within the uh, m uh, uh, me, and so forth. And the four, what is this? Who is Tenzin Gyatso? So if you think about it, you may feel something. Do you get some idea? The young ones, please tell me. How does this I look to you? When you think I am boy, I'm a girl, I'm a big shoe, and for me, in, I can say I'm a gelong, a big shoe, and I'm the Dalai Lama. But then, of course, if you were to pinpoint that I, of course, you cannot find that I. But then that doesn't mean that uh, this, this Gelong, the big shoe, doesn't exist at all. So what this shows is that although there, the, you, there is something, but when you, would, when you are to pinpoint at it, you cannot find it. What this shows is that the, this I, this Gelong or Tenzin Gyatso or Dalai Lama or girl and boy and so forth, exists by way of designation, independence on other factors. Just as Nagarjuna has said, a person is not the, uh, the earth element and so forth, but then a person is merely designated on the basis of these six elements. And Chandrakirti also says, in the sutra it says that uh, just as a chariot is designated on the basis of its parts, uh, the, the assemblage of all the parts, uh, Likewise, a person is designated or labeled on the basis of the aggregates. And similarly, this is said by Chandrakirti. Of course, if you take the example of hands, of course, you'll say this is your hand. But then if you were to take apart all these fingers and the other parts of the hands, you will not find a hand that you can pinpoint to. And then you may go to the fingers and say, this is a finger. And if you were to again analyze where the finger is, uh, what that is, you cannot find it um, at all. So whatever you take as the basis of analysis, you will not be able to pinpoint to the thing at all as being this or that. And similarly, it is the case with the time, past, future, and present. And then we may talk about an aeon, or a year, or month, or weeks, a week, or day, hour, minute, second. So everything that you check, examine, will not be found. So there is no present. Of course, past and future are Posited in relation to the present, but then if you were to pinpoint where the present is, you cannot find it. And therefore, it shows that there is something, but then you cannot find it under analysis. And therefore, the Buddha gave the teaching on emptiness and selflessness. All phenomena are empty and selfless. But then, what it shows is that when you think about an I, it is there in dependence on other phenomena. So although there is an I which is dependent, there is no I which is independent of the designation. 
And so, just think of, reflect on this non-existence of inherent or independent existence of an I. And then this transforms into a free syllable, which in turn it transforms into a Chandrasik, yourself as Chandrasik. Please read this. So you have requested the master to let you into the supreme city of uh, bliss, uh, city of liberation, which is the mandala. To, in other words, you have asked him to give you the uh, initiation. So when you think about the uh, liberation, uh, first you should think about causality, law of causality, how uh, causes and conditions give rise to their effects. Of course, when you think about an effect, you can tell that the effect is dependent on causes and conditions. But then the causes and conditions themselves, which gives, gives rise to those effects, uh, give rise to those effects, are themselves um, posited in relation to their effect. And so there is nothing which is independently existent in that sense. We're, but then we have ignorance, which sees things as having some independent intrinsic existence, which is not the reality. So you have to confirm to yourself that there is no such thing as independent uh, existence at all. And therefore, when you think about emptiness, you can see the possibility of nirvana. And uh, by that, uh, you can also th uh, come to the conclusion that it is possible to uh, reach omniscience. <coughs> omniscience state of omniscience means that you have abandoned or overcome all kinds of delusions within yourself. And then uh, also you come to the uh, th uh, conclusion that there is the practice of the antra, the uh, uh, the practice of non-indivisibility of profundity and clarity. So here the Guru is instructing the uh, disciples the, what has been explained in certain verses. And next is the taking of Bodhisattva vow, but we'll not do it at this stage. We'll do it during the actual initiation. Uh, Bodhisattva, but we will here do a short uh, ceremony for, for Bodhicitta. This all sentient beings, including yourself, are, do not want, are equal in that you don't want ha suffering, but want happiness. The more you think of helping others, caring about others, uh, the uh, more you'll be able to achieve your own goal. The more you be, uh, remain selfish, you'll not be able to uh, gain uh, much. So the highest goal that you can achieve with selfish motivation is, of course, to reach a nirvana, mere nirvana. Uh, so you will not be able to uh, achieve or the goal of helping others limitlessly. And therefore, have this motivation of becoming a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So please meditate on bodhicitta now. So please uh, kneel on your right knee or crouch. So imagine Avalokiteshvara with the deities and also the uh, imagine the guru as uh, in the form of Avalokiteshvara and imagine Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the space before you. Please say this through the practices of prostration and so forth. The seven limbs we are going through this. May I dedicate all the virtues that I collect through prostration, confession, and so forth uh, for 
to become a Buddha. So please repeat these lines. So you by these with these lines that you're going to repeat, what you're saying is that you will generate uh, the bodhicitta for the benefit of all sentient beings, with the wish to liberate all sentient beings to the Buddha and Dharma and Sangha until the heart of the enlightenment is rich, I take refuge in you. Enthused by wisdom and compassion in front of in front of the Buddhas, I generate the Bud, uh, bodhicitta. Repeat again. With the wish to benefit, liberate all sentient beings. So at the end of this repetition, just feel confirmed that uh, I mean, feel that you will keep this bodhicitta until you become the now, in order to uh, enhance this bodhicitta further and further, please see these lines again. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too remain and dispel the miseries of sentient beings. So have this courage to work for the benefit of sentient beings until the end of space. So think that you are someone who is here to uh, serve other sentient beings. So you should think that you are someone who can be of help to other sentient beings and not the otherwise, that you, think you should not think that others are there for your um, utility. As Nagarjuna has said, may I become like this, a, a, a sustenance for, for all sentient beings like the earth and so forth, earth elements. So, so similarly, it is said in, uh, by Shantideva, in Bodhisattva Charyavata. So please sit down. So now the disciples, uh, earlier it was said that you have arisen into the form of Avalokiteshvara with one face, two hands. And now at your uh, forehead or throat and uh, heart, imagine these three letters, Om, A, Hum, respectively. And His Holiness will uh, do some gesture, and uh, while do, uh, you s when that is done, imagine that your body, speech, and mind are blessed. So, what does blessing here mean is, so far we have actually let our body, speech, and mind uh, under the sway of uh, uh, self-cherishing attitude and ignorance, and and done all kinds of things to us, harm others with our body, speech, and mind. And so now, from now on, you think of actually using your body, speech, and mind to benefit all sentient beings. So with this understanding, just imagine that your body, speech, and mind are transformed in order to be of benefit to others. And so, uh, having blessed your body, speech, and minds, now you are made offerings of the lamp, uh, flower, incense, and uh, scent, and so forth. <laughs> Next is the tossing of uh, tooth, a neem uh, stick, 
So the Tibetan parliamentarian for the Ba people from the Ba is going to throw the stick. So when the uh, the parliamentarian when the bar uh, the parliamentary member of the bar uh, region throws this stick, please uh, everybody else imagine who uh, throwing it. So repeat this after His Holiness. Uh, imagining that you are actually throwing the stick, the neem stick, on the tray. Please repeat. Hold your hands, palms together. Om Bezar Hasa Ha and release the fingers. Imagining that you are throwing the stick. On. So the tip of the stick shows towards the master, which is an indication of the uh, highest city. Next is giving the blessed water, a handful of water to uh, cleanse us of the negativities of body, speech, and mind. So the weather is cold, and on top of that, please drink this cold water also. And next uh, is the distribution of a blessed string. So, Ms. Olney said we don't need to distribute the kusha grass. Please take only one string and don't go for more. So uh, we'll not do the part about uh, checking dream because the initiation is being given, actual initiation is being on the same day. Mm, next, please make a mandala offering for the next initiation. Please repeat this request.
Please let me into the great city of liberation. So the term Sangak, secret mantra, shows that this practice of tantra has to be done in secrecy and secretly. And mantra means protecting the mind. So protecting, protecting of mind means protecting it from ordinary perception of yourself as an ordinary person. So how that is done is you bring about insight into emptiness and that insight into emptiness transforms into uh, this insight into emptiness uh, which has the quality of indivisibility of profundity and clarity is transformed into a deity, a form of deity. And then Tantra is also called the Vajrayana. So Vajra here shows the, that of inseparability. So uh, the indivisibility here means the method and the wisdom are combined into one. And therefore, this is the path that you use to travel or journey to the uh, city of liberation or uh, omniscient state of Buddhahood. And therefore, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the process is called, uh, or the path, it is called the path or the yana, vehicle. Later, you'll be able to uh, you, you imagine entering the mandala and uh, throw a flower into it and then in order to check which uh, Buddha lineage you belong to or you uh, would actually become um, enlightened into. And so in order to check that you have to throw a flower. So you are given a flower each. So imagine that you are given a garland of flower as well. Sizan is saying there's some yeah, elderly monk up there who seems to be feeling really cold, so put on some more robes on him. So there is the Ushnisha, the protrusion, uh, the protruded kind of a head, which represents uh, the, what do you call, protrusion, crown protrusion. the pointed sort of hat which is worn and then there are other ropes deity Vishnisha hmm? so pointed hat Then hold your hand in this lotus uh, lineage uh, gesture. So put your hands together, the sight, and open your hands up and say, <laughs> this. 
Touch of So with the three letters Om, Ah, and Home on your crown, throat, and heart, uh, from these letters, rays of light imagine, uh, emit, and your body becomes luminous. And next is Bodhisattva vows. Now by taking the vow, what you are th actually thinking is that you will become not only think or wish to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, but you also intend to actually engage in the Bodhisattva practices, such as the six paramitas and the four ways of attracting disciples. So you're not only intending to become a Buddha, but even from now on, engage in practices of generosity and also uh, your body, speech and mind are totally dedicated for the benefit of other sentient beings. And you will uh, not lose heart, but put effort and persevere in all the practices which bring about happiness and well-being for others. And uh, your practice, you think of practicing uh, patience and uh, the perfection of concentration and uh, wisdom and also the practices of the, the four ways of uh, attracting disciples, gathering disciples, such as uh, giving and giving teaching, um, and talking uh, gently and actually showing the example yourself and uh, then giving them the teachings as to how to practice Bodhisattva, how to engage in Bodhisattva practices. And you will not praise yourself and despise others and also not uh, keep the Bodhisattva vows such as not praising oneself and despising others. Um, and then also accepting others' uh, apologies or uh, forgiving others. So there are these 18 root downfalls. The worst of these is giving up bodhicitta, thinking that it's not possible for me to really work for other sentient beings. So if you think that, you will immediately lose bodhicitta. And then there is the, uh, the wrong view. So for these two, the losing bodhicitta and wrong view, it said that you will uh, you don't need the four binding factors, whereas uh, the other 16, for them to uh, become a root downfall, uh, you will need these. And so. If you think of others' well-being, then you will not commit those other uh, downfalls as well. And then there are the uh, 46 secondary vows of bodhisattvas, uh, which you'll be able to uh, actually keep. So if you think you can keep these 18 root downfalls and the 46 secondary vows, uh, you should take the Bodhisattva vows here, but if you think you can't keep the Bodhisattva vows, then you should, uh, should not take the vows, but just have the um, wish that in the future you may be able to uh, engage in the Bodhisattva practices and keep these vows in the future. But Quinkin Jamyang Shepa, a master who lived in the 17th, 18th century, has said that so far we have taken rebirth in hell realms so many times, but not because of uh, over, uh, uh, overriding or uh, transgressing the Bodhisattva and Tantric vows. And so, 
by taking the Bodhisattva vows and uh, tantric uh, initiation and so forth, of course, it has it leaves. Uh, these leaves some very powerful imprint on your mind, and because of those imprints, even if you were born, you were to born uh, to be reborn. I mean, uh, in hell realm, it is said that you will uh, come out quickly because of the power of these imprints. So the, uh, the lines that we'll repeat after His Holiness goes through uh, like this. I take refuge in the three jewels. I confess all the negative deeds individually. And so this is, uh, these two lines show the confession of, by take, after taking refuge. <laughs> and then you say, uh, I take, I rejoice in the good deeds of others. And then uh, the next line says, I will take to my heart the enlightenment of Buddhahood. So Buddhahood uh, here, the term for Buddha in Sanskrit, uh, the enlightenment in Sanskrit is Buddha, which has the meaning of, on the one hand, uh, like an, an called opening of a flower uh, and also overcoming all negativities. So opening of a flower and <laughs> refers to being knowledgeable about everything and then also overcoming all negativities. So so you are free from all def uh, faults and you are complete with all qualities and enlightenment. So we have the innate uh, state of mind, um, which of course, when we are free from all uh, negativities, then this uh, becomes manifest. And uh, so what uh, hinders us from uh, reaching enlightenment or nirvana is basically the, the afflictive thoughts and emotions. And then what hinders us from actually uh, uh, becoming a Buddha is, uh, and help other sentient beings is that of the obscuration to knowledge, cognitive obscuration. So in Buddhahood, when you become a Buddha, you, be, you reach or attain Dharmakaya. And therefore, once you reach Dharmakaya, you are a Buddha. And in order to become a Buddha, of course, you have to go through the path of a Bodhisattva, which means a trainee level uh, uh, Arya being. Um, and before that, of course, you have to reach uh, attain the lower parts and progress along. Sri Solonis was talking about talking to some kids who need to go to restroom. He told them to go. So we have the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And even Tibetans sometimes use this uh, to swear and Kambas use another swearing, which is called Digpa Kur. <coughs> Sometimes they, they even swear in the name of Vajrasattva. <coughs> so the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, are the objects of refuge for Buddhists. Chandrakirti says that Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are the refuges or for those aspiring liberation. <laughs> so he's not saying that in order to reach higher rebirth in the next life, uh, we should take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. 
Even in Christianity, they have the, uh, uh, the Trinity. And uh, when people really uh, care about others' well-being in their life, then, of course, they, they create the causes for higher rebirth. And similarly in uh, Islam, when you're really a good, sincere practitioner, a uh, friend of mine, uh, Islam, uh, friend, a Muslim friend of mine has said that we must respect all, and all beings equally, just as you respect uh, uh, Allah. So with such practice of you know, respecting all sentient, all life, I mean, of course you will be able to create causes for higher rebirth. So here, uh, Chandrakirti is not saying that you should take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha so that you will have higher rebirth, but he's saying that this refuge, these three are the refuge for someone who aspires liberation. What he uh, alludes to is the teaching of uh, selflessness that is, given, uh, that is found only in Buddhism and not other religious traditions. So the, inf the infallible object of refuge for those who wish to become uh, rich and uh, liberation uh, are the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So the Buddha is the teacher, uh, the uh, Dharma is the actual refuge, and the uh, Sangha are those who assist us on the path. So just as you should diagnose uh, the disease and then get the, the medication and cure the disease and finally um, regain your uh, health, uh, likewise the teaching. The Buddha is the teaching of the Buddha is like the medicine to cure the disease of our uh, afflictive thoughts and emotions and others. And so this uh, freedom from uh, this disease is the cessation. So in order to cure your disease, you have to first know what has caused this uh, disease, the imbalance of the elements, and gain the balance of the elements. And when your when your elements are get balanced, then you uh, you'll uh, be cured of the disease. And so, in order to get the cure, uh, you have to rely on a doctor. So, the, the Buddha is like the doctor, not the medicine, and the Dharma is like the medicine, and uh, then the Sangha are like the nurses. Therefore, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are the refuges for uh, refuges for uh, those who wish to become liberated. And so the Buddha shows us the path as a teacher, and then the Sangha are assistants on our path, but the actual agent that actually uh, that helps us uh, to go out of suffering uh, is the Dharma. So we have to go through the progression of the path. Um, we have to develop the antidote to the uh, negative uh, negativities uh, by which we can actually uh, experience the nirvana or cessation. And in order, uh, before reaching the cessation and before reaching the actual antidote, which is the path of seeing, we have to go through the path of preparation. And before that, we have to go to, uh, uh, attain the path of accumulation. And so, uh, through the path of, uh, by going through the path of accumulation and preparation, then you will uh, reach the path of seeing. And when you reach the path of seeing, you have attained the actual uh, the, uh, the antidote to the uh, the adventitious uh, negative witties uh, within yourself. And then, when you uh, eliminate them, you uh, attain the cessation within yourself. 
And then finally, uh, still when you uh, progress further and further, you will reach Buddhahood. So the, the true path that is generated within yourself uh, when you reach the path of seeing and the true cessation which you uh, gain through that true path are the actual uh, dharmas. And so through the practice of our morality, concentration and wisdom, uh, we uh, actually can lead ourselves um, uh, higher and higher to reach the, those uh, paths. So in the uh, Mahayana Uttara Tantra of Maitreya, he, um, which has three, uh, he goes through these uh, seven points, which are called the Vajra, seven Vajra points, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, then the, uh, uh, the Tathagata Garbha, or, and then you have enlightenment and the qualities of Buddhahood and uh, Buddhas, and then the enlightened activities of the Buddhas. So this, the sequence that is given actually makes sense. And so in the lines that we are going to repeat, there is a mention of, I will take, to, uh, I will take hold of uh, the enlightenment of Buddhahood in my heart. And then, in order to uh, in order to achieve the goal for oneself and others, I will generate bodhicitta. So, if you whatever you wish to achieve, whether it's uh, some goal for yourself or uh, others, I mean, uh, you if you do. Practice bodhicitta, cultivate bodhicitta, you'll be able to fulfill all, the, all of them. <laughs> and then having generated bodhicitta, uh, And then I will engage in the uh, pleasant or attractive um, pr practices of bodhisattvas. So this uh, attractiveness here refers to the bodhisattvas being, uh, the, the practice of bodhisattvas being able to fulfill the goal of oneself and others. Zalun is asking if those kids who went to the toilet have come back or not. Because we are now going to start the Bodhisattva vows. You distracted me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the joke.
this out and joked about those kids. Maybe they have run away because they felt they're feeling cold. <laughs> <laughs> so please, this is uh, taking Bodhisattva vows. <laughs> so this is the essence of the Nalanda tradition of Buddhism. So generating bodhicitta and taking bodhisattva vows. So imagine in front of you, in the space, Avalokiteshvara and Buddha's bodhisattvas and other deities think that you will have this determination to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings and in order to reach that state of Buddhahood that you will keep, uh, you, uh, cultivate, uh, take the bodhisattva vows. Just as all those masters of the past the, uh, in, of India and also the masters of the uh, Tibetan Buddhist traditions, so all of them have made this practice as the essence of the, uh, their practice. And then also have engaged in the bodies of the practices. Please repeat, I take refuge in the Buddha rituals and confess all negativities. Rejoice in the good deeds of others. I take to heart the Buddha the enlightenment to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. I take refuge in the enlightenment. In order to benefit oneself and others, I'll generate bodhicitta. Having generated this bodhicitta, I'll call all sentient beings as guests, my guests, and i engage in the attractive bodhisattva deeds. May I become a Bodhisattva Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Please repeat this again. Just as the past masters and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have generated Bodhicitta and taken Bodhisattva vows and engaged in the Bodhisattva deeds, likewise I will do so. Take refuge in the Bodhisattva, Buddha Bodhisattva rituals and confess all misdeeds. I rejoice in the good deeds of others and take to heart Buddhahood. I, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, I take refuge under enlightenment. I will generate Bodhicitta. Having generated Bodhicitta, I will call all sentient beings as my guests and engage in the attractive Bodhisattva practices in order to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Now these girls have come back. <laughs> So let's repeat these lines for the third time. At the end, when you say, in order to become a Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings, please feel convinced that you have received the Bodhisattva vows. So I take Bodhisattva vows every day. And earlier this morning, when I uh, prepared for this initiation also, I took Bodhisattva vows. So just as I have the, the Bodhisattva vows within myself, likewise, you th uh, please imagine that I uh, think that you also receive the same Bodhisattva vows. Please repeat. I took refuge in the three jewels. I confess all the misdeeds, rejoice in all good deeds of others, and take to heart Buddhahood. In the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, I take refuge until I am enlightened. And uh, I'll in order to benefit myself and others, I'll generate bodhicitta. Having generated bodhicitta, I'll call all sentient beings as my guests and engage in the attractive bodhisattva practices in order to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Please repeat these lines. May this precious bodhisattva gym grow where it has not yet grown 
and may it grow further and further where it has already enhanced further and further where it's grown. <coughs> Today, my life has borne fruit. Uh, my hu human life has become precious. I was not cause defect or to the Bodhisattva. So having promised that you will uh, engage in the Bodhisattva practices, now in order to reach the goal of Buddhahood, uh, of course there are, uh, within the Buddhahood, there are those of the, uh, the form body and the Dharmakaya. And for these, uh, we have the set different courses the accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom bring about these two. So Chandrakirti also uh, says in his Madhyamaka Avatara that uh, may I be able to reach the further shore of the ocean um, by developing the conventional and the ultimate bodhicitta, the two, like the, which are like the two wings of a bird. So, uh, the bodhicitta, uh, conventional bodhicitta, is the cause for the uh, form body of a Buddha, and the ultimate bodhicitta is the cause for uh, wisdom or dharmakaya. And Bodhisattva Charya Avatara says, if you don't exchange your uh, happiness uh, with the suffering of others, uh, you will not reach. You will not have happiness, even in samsara, live alone, reaching enlightenment or Buddhahood. Therefore, if you engage in helping other sentient beings, I mean, your own goal of happiness will come by. So you have to take care of, care about sentient beings, just as you care about your life. So we want happiness, but if you let yourself under the sway of uh, self-centered attitude, then you will not, of course, reach Buddhahood. But even in samsara, you will not be happy if you don't exchange your happiness with suffering of others. So if you think about things in this world, for example, people's like, uh, people like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, they have dedicated their life for others' well-being, others' rights, freedom, and therefore other people also believe them, trust them, and like them, admire them. Whereas if leaders only think of their power, I mean, they will not be happy. The rest of the world will criticize them. So this is true. It is true that uh, you know if you don't exchange your happiness with suffering of others, you will not have happiness even in samsara. So if you can do that, to exchange your happiness with the suffering of others, then you will be able to achieve your own goal as well. So we are human beings. We can think about future, a long time, the long-term benefits. Therefore, 
not thinking selfishly, not thinking only uh, to benefit yourself alone, but thinking of helping others. So if you can do that, if you can actually think of others' well-being over your own selfish goals, then you would be the best kind of selfish person, so to say. So the bodhisattvas are the, those who are best at uh, getting what they want in the end. But we are not able to do that yet. So Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, in, in Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, Shanti Deva says that all the happiness, well-being in the world come from selfish motive, selfish attitude, and all the happiness in the world come from thinking of others, cherishing others. And what more needs to be said, look at the difference between the Buddhas and the sentient beings. So the Buddhas have become fully enlightened because of having practiced, uh, having cherished others over themselves. And we are left still left in samsara because of our selfish attitude. We still are overpowered by uh, the, the contaminated psychophysical aggregates. It's because of the uh, having bent ourselves to uh, giving ourselves into the selfish motive, selfish attitude. So now we have to understand that the result of selfish attitude, self-centeredness, is only suffering for ourselves and uh, exchange it with the cherishing others. I do this on a daily basis. I take, I, I say this verse. I, I, say, I say this verse from Mula uh, Madhimaka Karika, which says, uh, prost I prostrate to you, Gautama, who taught the, who out of your compassion um, taught us the holy dharma in order to rid us of all wrong views. And so I do this right in the beginning of my day when I wake up. Although I'm a little bit lazy, I do, I do say this prayer and hold my hand, hands in this uh, uh, fold together. Uh, while I still am lying in bed. And so, if you just think that I have to do something, uh, if I give a dirty uh, joke, I don't know. <laughs> so you should not, uh, in other words, His Holiness is talking about not being uh, too formal and serious in front of others. Uh, of course, we can, you should think that everybody is the same. We are all same human beings. They don't want suffering. They want happiness. I want happiness and not suffering. And so I also think like that. I don't think that I am somebody special because it's no use. Even if I may be in front, talking in front of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, I always consider others to be same as me, as being humans. So there's no need to be uh, formal. Uh, and so if you think about the bodhisattva uh, trainings or practices of bodhisattvas, this gives you real uh, joy in your heart. 
recently when my friends, very close friends, uh, whom, with whom I really joke uh, very much, Bishop Tutu, I went to receive him at the airport. So when he got down from the plane, he told me, uh, how are you? You look very healthy. <laughs> and I asked him how my complexion is and how, how I look. He said, very beautiful. <laughs> so I'm very healthy. So it's because uh, I'm happy. I'm always feeling relaxed. So if you, if you uh, let yourself be overcome with uh, selfish attitudes, self-centeredness, then you'll not be happy. So if you really uh, open, be open to others and uh, practice cherishing others more, then you'll be happy. So having found this human life now, and you have this opportunity to take Bodhisattva vows, now, earlier, uh, we said that you have uh, imagined yourself as Avalokiteshvara. Uh, you should think that you, until the end of samsara, you will uh, practice uh, bodhicitta. So, Mahayana Uttara Tantra says that we have the potential for becoming enlightened. So we have the innate, clear light nature of the mind. And because of this, this is sometimes uh, termed as the enlightenment within yourself, which is innate within yourself. So sometimes the term uh, primordial Buddha uh, is, Buddhahood is used, which refers to this potential within us to become a Buddha. In other words, the Tathagata Garbha or Buddha nature. And uh, we, have to, we have to know that uh, we have this potential and take care of it and nurture it and generate bodhicitta. Now, uh, generate bodhicitta within yourself. So, so first generate bodhicitta. Think of becoming a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So this is bodhicitta. So, this bodhicitta, which thinks of only helping other sentient beings, this uh, excellent motivation, courage, which is the source of all happiness, temporary as well as ultimate. <laughs> In other words, you should think that this is the essence of how um, your practice as human beings, having found this human life, this is the essence of your life. So just as it is said in the Guide to Bodhisattva, it is the, like the churning of the butter from, ma from milk of Dharma. So imagine that this bodhicitta that you have meditated, transforms into a moon disk at your heart. <laughs> and then the antidote to uh, grasping at true existence is understanding emptiness. So 
a grasping, this grasping at true existence says that things do have ex uh, independent existence. Whereas the uh, wisdom realizing selflessness actually checks whether this is the way it exists, just as uh, it is uh, claimed by or uh, through grasp grasping at true existence. In, even in quantum physics today, the scientists say that when you analyze things, and uh, matter and particles and particles into others, um, the subparticles and so forth, finally, there's nothing that you can actually pinpoint uh, as being this and that. And so they say there's nothing objectively existing. So, of course, lower uh, schools of Tenet within Buddhism say that, they, of course, still, although you cannot uh, find something objectively out there, still the mind is uh, truly existent. Whereas Madhyamaka say that whatever there is in the world, nothing has any objective existence. Why? There should be a reason to this. Because they are dependent on others. So something which is dependent cannot be independent. They are uh, mutually exclusive. So as we talked about earlier, when you were to find this I, you cannot find it. But this I is designated on the basis of the psychophysical aggregates and similarly, the, the three times, past, future, and present, are designated. And therefore, we use the term nominal existence. But that doesn't mean that you can um, think about something and that the thing actually can happen just like that. That doesn't mean it. Although there is an object, if you were to find that object within it, you you'll find that it's merely labeled. It's merely uh, that the, that object exists merely by way of designation. So what is left is the name, because you cannot find that thing with that label in the object itself. So in uh, Nagarjuna's Ratnavale, it is said that if uh, I mean, everything is merely designated, there's nothing objectively existing. So since there's nothing objectively existent, you'll also know that the, the name itself doesn't have any intrinsic existence. Sometimes when we say there's nothing objectively existing, there's only name, it might give you the idea that the name then should must be uh, uh, something that exists independently. But that's not the case either. When there's no object that the name actually is used for, I mean, you cannot also have the name independently existing as well. And so you have to know that there's nothing which exists independently. <laughs> so in short, as Shantideva says, uh, Aya Deva says in his 400 verses, what is dependently arising does not have any autonomous existence. Things which are dependent on others for its identity cannot be autonomous. Therefore, all these do not have autonomous existence, and therefore there is no self. Now when we say no self, selflessness, it doesn't mean 
we are not re uh, that we are rejecting the self in the sense of when we make the distinction between I or self as myself and you. So self in selflessness means that there is no static, independent, um, objectively existing person. So we are not rejecting the conventional existing, conventionally existing self, as we refer to uh, myself and yourself and so forth. Uh, and in that sense, the self is there, but then the self being rejected is the independent existing independently existing existent self. <laughs> so Ari Nagarjuna also says So meditate on emptiness or selflessness a little bit using these reasonings that everything is uh, dependent on others, therefore there's nothing independently existing. So that mere negation of independent existence is what we should meditate on. You can think about the Buddhahood, the path that leads to that goal, and yourself. Everything doesn't exist. Just the way they appear to. So to your mind, what you should uh, in your mind, what you what you should con uh, come to the conclusion is, uh, and Sapa has said this. In this in this space or the sky, which is pure by nature, the uh, the clouds of all these myriads of things appear. And the seventh Dalai Lama also says, just as the, the clouds dissip dissipate in the space, likewise all these dualistic appearances dissolve into the nature of the mind. So meditate on this kind of emptiness or selflessness, that things do not have any inherent existence, that they do not have any intrinsic nature in themselves. <laughs> to make it simple, you are looking up at me, and you think, of course, that His Holiness is up there on the throne, but then you should think like this, that His Holiness, or Tenzin Gyatso, who is he? I hear his voice, I see his body, and through his voice and through his body uh, expressions, and I could perhaps infer that maybe he's thinking this or thinking that. So you will be able to infer some of my thoughts. I mean, whose mind is that? To whom does it belong? Of course, it's His Holiness. My voice is not me. My mind is my thoughts are not me. If you think like that, analyze me in this way, I mean, you might find it quite strange. Or, or then, what is there, kind of? So what that shows is that usually when you think about me or see me, I mean, you have this notion of me as having some kind of independent, static kind of ex um, existence, some kind of a god. So that is being harmed or undermined. So what, that's, what does it help is when we, for example, become angry at somebody, <laughs> then we, are, we become angry at the, the person 
because of his or her uh, verbal expressions, bad uh, language used towards us, or some kind of a physical uh, expression that we disliked. Although we think I am angry with this person called Dorji, but you, if, at close look, if you were to check where Dorji is, who is Dorji? then you may not be able to actually pinpoint where Dorji is, who Dorji is. And so that helps to, uh, to undermine this intense emotion that you get when usually we, you think about others as having some kind of a, uh, which comes because of um, thinking of some independently existing Dorji or somebody there. So this is being kind of uh, uh, checked when you meditate on emptiness or selflessness. So please meditate on selflessness. <laughs> so this mantra on Sarvayo Now, please repeat this mantra, Om Sarva Yoga Chita, Upatayami, Om Sarva Yoga Chita, Upatayami, Om Sarva Yoga Chita. I think we missed one thing here. So uh, actually we have to go through the process of uh, transforming this understanding of insight and emptiness in, into a Vajra on the uh, moon disk. And uh, then with the Vajra and the moon bodhicittas at your heart, you, what you have done is by reciting the mantra that you will keep these two bodhicittas within yourself. So uh, whenever I give uh, initiations, I always ask people to remind them, so to, to recall these two, the bodhicitta, conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta, which refers to the meditation on emptiness, um, should be, I mean, you should recall it on a daily basis. If you think about these two every day, then as weeks, months, and years, or decades, and uh, scars of years, and uh, half a century, or some things like that pass by, then you will see some change. Otherwise, if you just put, as Gondana Buja says, uh, that some people put so much effort in something in the beginning, and then they, they, they slacken their effort as time goes by, and in the end, there's nothing that they can actually achieve. So you will not have realizations, of course, if you do like that. So doing something uh, very... Uh, with intense effort right in the beginning, I mean, it's not so good uh, if you slacken your effort later on. So if you think that until the end of the space, uh, my only goal is to, uh, to benefit other sentient beings, then you will not lose heart to work for others' well-being. So you have to have this courage and determination. So just as you have imagined the moon and the Vajra at your heart, uh, think that uh, the same similar moon and uh, Vajra are at the heart of the Guru. And so imagine that the replicas from I mean, uh, the moon and Vajra at the heart of the Guru comes forth and dissolves into the moon and the Vajra at your heart, thereby stabilizing the moon and Vajra bodhicittas within yourself. So next is actually asking the disciples to keep the secrecy 
uh, keep secret the, sigma, the practice of Tantra and not to disclose it to those who are not initiated and who have no faith in Tantra. Now imagine that you are going inside the mandala and taking, uh, making, uh, going around the deities. Om Mar, repeat this. This is the man. Amarada, Sundinda, Sudogo, Susoko, Benzasato, Adisidimam, Marada, Sundinda, Sudoko, Susoko, Benzasato, Adisidimam. Touch your folded hands and on the, your crown. Om Namateum, say this. Touch your throat and Om Namamehum, say. Touch your heart and say this. Namo Namahum Soha. So this is uh, to symbolize that you have to prostrate to the deities with your body, speech, and mind. Please repeat this. So imagine that the, uh, the compassion of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas come in the form of uh, Avalokiteshvara, uh, the, the blessings of body uh, in the form of Avalokiteshvara and uh, the blessings of speech in the form of mantras of Avalokiteshvara and the blessings of their mind in the form of the uh, symbols and the seed syllable of Avalokiteshvara and descend into you and dissolve into you. <laughs> Next is asking the, what color appears to your eyes. Those of you who have the blindfold, cover your eyes a little bit and those, you don't, those who don't have the blindfold, just close your eyes a little bit and when he's on us, what appears to your eyes, just open your eyes, or those who have the blindfolds, uh, take off the blindfold a little bit and look up in the space. Look up in the space now. Suddenly look up in the space. Although it uh, doesn't happen all uh, every time we uh, have initiations, but sometimes it happens that some people see different colors, uh, red or yellow or uh, some other color. Perhaps uh, these, ha these are seen when you are happy. Please repeat this. Sri Benzakorta, you are going around the mandala. Sri Benzakorta, hulu hulu humpe. Sri Benzakorta, hayagirwa, hulu hulu humpe. So next is uh, praying to for the wisdom beings to be uh, brought down into your if the Lama has time and uh, is good, healthy, then he can come down from the throne and go to the mandala. So sometime in July and August, I was not feeling well. So in any case, he's only just going to do it from the throne. <laughs> So you have uh, the flowers with you. So 
So the uh, Tibetan parliament uh, member, Kesan uh, Gensen La, will represent the will represent all the lay people and uh, Gyan Wang Da will represent all the monks and nuns. So please hold your uh, the flower in your hand between the fingers. <laughs> hold the flower in your hands. So one Tibetan old man seems to be too familiar and he just put the flower on his head already, which is not supposed to be done yet. So it's certain that if we put effort, we can become Buddhas because we have the Buddha nature. Now with regard to the different techniques and the means which you apply within yourself and practice to become a Buddha. So within the Tantra, there are the five Buddha families, Akshobhya, Ratnasambhava, uh, Amitabha, Amogasiddhi, and Ratnasam, uh, Verachana. And so now, if you know which lineage you belong to, and if it is more effective if you do uh, practice in relation to that particular uh, Buddha family. And therefore, this is checked by throwing the flower in the mandala. So please hold the flower between your fingers and pray that, make your wish that it may fall on the deity with whom you have the special karmic uh, connection. First, please repeat this. Sanjay Kunjun Tajisha. Altuze Kono. Member Kunjish. Member Zapata. Gyan. So, first, Gyan Wangda will throw. For all the monastics, monks and nuns, please repeat this. Monks and nuns, please repeat this. These are bands of who? So the flower for the monks and nuns fell on the uh, north, uh, or I mean, on Amoga City. And the secret name is Daniel Dorchi. These all the lay people, what is a Benza Ho? The flower fell on the east direction. And therefore, lay people, the secret name is Akshobhya Vajra. For the monastics, Amoga Siddhi Vajra. Mamoga Vajra. So now, please, uh, you may put the flower on your head or just stick it on your forehead if you want. Now take off the blindfolds, please. Someone is saying, uh, keep the flower on your head or forehead for a while, just so that you are aware that you are uh, receiving the blessings. And then if it's not staying, 
if it's being blown away by the wind, just take it off and uh, put it in your pocket. And now imagine that you are able to see the mandala deities with Avalokiteshvara. Uh, uh, who belongs to the Amitabha lineage in the center um, with another uh, deity at the heart and then the sixth syllable at his heart. <laughs> then the other Buddha family this mandala offering for the initiation. Please repeat this. Chanjudo Jasanjala. Chujin Chita Zawata. I know the church. Namgeto Jasanjala. Namgeto Jatindatsu. Namgeto Jatindatsu. So now, next is the actual initiation. The first one is the water initiation. <laughs> so for this, the Vajra Master uh, invites the, invite the initiation deities who confer the initiation upon the disciples. So with this water initiation, imagine that the negativities of the body are cleansed. Mm. It leaves the imprint for the negativities to be cleansed. It induces wisdom, realizing emptiness. And this wisdom of emptiness is also indivisible wisdom of prof profound profound and clarity so this initiation the water initiation leaves the imprint for uh, attaining dharmakaya in the end Please repeat this request. Don't you do just one Change the other one. Then the rubber ditch. Namget or Jindatu. Namget or Jindatu. So this next is the initiation, the crown initiation. Thank 
And uh, this crown initiation leaves in prints for uh, the form body. Next is the repetition. And then Dagger Song again. Dalan Yorzitis. Dalan Yorzitis. Please be close to me. So, the Guru appearing as Chandrasi Avalokiteshwara has a wisdom being at his heart, and at the wisdom being's heart is the three uh, syllable, and around the three syllable is the Om Mani Peme Hum, the six syllable mantra. So you will repeat this mantra after uh, me, after the Guru. And uh, as you repeat this mantra, imagine that the change of this mantra comes out of my mouth and enters your mouth. And you'll repeat this three times. The first time you repeat it, uh, you imagine that the change of mantra come out of the Guru's mouth and enters your mouth and are placed at your heart around the three syllable at your heart. And then at the second time, uh, the second chain of mantra comes and uh, becomes uh, And again, they, they, they go down your mouth and uh, sits, uh, stands on the uh, mantra at your heart. And then uh, at the third time, the uh, chains of mantra come out and enter your mouth and become uh, indivisible. One, it's the mantra at your heart. And so here, with regard to the mantra, the Om represents body, speech, and mind. Uh, it uh, is contains three letters, A, U, and Ma. And so these three letters represent our body, speech, and mind, which are contaminated at this stage. But when these three are totally uh, purified of all negativities, then they become the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. Or <coughs> And so, someone with the body, speech, and mind uh, is designated on the basis of them. And so, becoming, to become someone who is full of negativities, uh, as someone who is totally free of all these negativities, you need to go through certain um, means, which has to be, this has to be brought about by certain means. And this is represented or symbolized by the money, which is the jewel, and uh, Padma, which is the lotus. And so money and Padma represents the, uh, the method and wisdom which are the bodhisattva, uh, bodhicitta, and the wisdom uh, of emptiness. And so these two combined together uh, purify our negativities and then transform our body, speech, and mind into the body, speech, and mind of an enlightened being, or we become, in other words, an enlightened person through these two practices. And so through these practice, we uh, can uh, attain the indivisible Vajra uh, practice of method and wisdom, which bring about the three uh, secrets which are indivisible in a Buddha. <laughs> so if you uh, if you can understand the meaning of Om Mani Peme Hum in this way, it is really inclusive uh, way of understanding, because uh, within the practice of it includes the practice of bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness. So through the yoga, Vajra Yoga, 
uh, which is uh, inseparable uh, method and wisdom, then you can purify your body, speech, and mind into and become and attain a pure body, speech, and mind of a Buddha. Perhaps it's, uh, it is uh, some Amdo master from Tashikil Monastery in Amdo. If you uh, recite the uh, Tara Mantra, people think that they, it will help in longevity, for longevity, and uh, with you, uh, by, reciting, uh, by reciting Manjushri Mantra, people usually think of gaining some wisdom. But with, uh, uh, with, in the case of reciting Mani Mantra, or Mani Pemahom Mantra, you can think of the suffering of all sentient beings. So it's really powerful, he says. So with this practice of bodhicitta and emptiness, uh, if you can uh, recite the mantra of Avalokiteshvara as many times as possible, it will be really, it will be really effective. So Avalokiteshvara is the deity of compassion, and as you uh, develop more and more compassion, your, you will also accumulate more and more merit, and uh, that in turn helps you to uh, be successful in your practices. Omani pe me hum. Please repeat this. Omani pe me hum. Omani pe me hum. It's 11.30 now. Let's recite this Omani pe me hum mantra 21 times together. Omani pe me hum. 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 Omani Money be my home, 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 money be my So you're given all these, imagine that you are being given a wheel and a conch and a, uh, a scripture. Because you have received initiation now, think of, uh, to the best of your ability, whenever it's really uh, appropriate, uh, give teachings on emptiness. But if it's not uh, befitting to give such teachings on emptiness, then you have to be, uh, say, uh, tell others to have good heart, warm-heartedness. Even if someone, uh, there may be some, uh, it may be someone who uh, despises religion, and like an atheist. Uh, if you tell them to have good heart, I mean, they will not. Uh, dislike it. So uh, you have to see the time, the right time when you t tell people to do this. Because if someone is really angry, you can't tell them to be good. Uh, you can't give them any teaching. Next, imagine that you are being given the eight auspicious substances and the eight royal emblems. victorious over the four maras or evils. <laughs> 
So it is the Chandrasik or Avalokiteshwara, uh, thousand armed uh, Avalokiteshwara initiation is finished on this auspicious occasion of the full moon day. So do your uh, best to cultivate, uh, to keep a good, warm heart, and help others also as best as you can. So we have so many natural disasters as well as men, uh, disasters and problems created by humans. So you should make prayers for them to uh, stop. And so I have not much to say. Last year at this time, I uh, I ended the dual responsibility of the Dalai Lamas, which has uh, which has uh, which started since the, the fifth Dalai Lama's time, and so. Now, the first, second, and third Dalai Lamas, and the fourth Dalai Lama, they uh, only lived as religious uh, leaders, religious masters. Uh, they lived their life to benefit for the benefit of all sentient beings. So me too. Uh, at, until the, as long as I live. I will try my best, do my best to help bring peace in him, him in, uh, in the world, as well as to help broaden people's um, insights. Uh, and also, I will do my best to bring about uh, religious harmony. Uh, these two, bringing peace and nonviolence and. Uh, religious harmony are Indian traditions, ahimsa. It doesn't mean just physically re re showing physical restraint, but mainly it's about uh, re reducing our anger, jealousy, and all these negative uh, destructive emotions. If your mind is all the time disturbed with these negative destructive emotions, then you will, of course, cause harm to others. So I emphasize, when I talk about ahimsa or nonviolence, I emphasize the practice of compassion. If you are if you're compassionate, then you will have a happy family, happy human community, society. Of course, the different religious traditions have big differences in uh, terms of philosophical understanding, in, in terms of philosophy. But, I mean, of course, we find in the classical texts there are, uh, I mean, huge differences in philosophical differences amongst the different, different religious traditions. And not even amongst the different religious traditions, but even within Buddhism, the different schools of thought have different uh, uh, understanding of the nature of things. So all these different classical texts written by the great masters were not meant are not meant for uh, creating more uh, arguments and uh, debate and conflict with, uh, amongst us, but actually. Uh, they are meant for uh, bringing about uh, enlightenment for ourselves by overcoming our distorted notions. So I've been t talking about this, uh, leaving the, res the political responsibility um, uh, since a long time. And so last year, I finally ended the political authority or responsibility of the Dalai Lamas. And so please stay happily. Uh, mandala offering, this Thanksgiving mandala offering.
This is the prayer called the words of truth by His Holiness. Oh, <laughs> 